play version of a Christmas Carol, which was originally a novella or short novel uh, by Charles Dickens. And so this is an adaptation for this. So if you look at the beginning page that has a list of characters, it also provides the background for it, uh, which is Charles Dickens novella, A Christmas Carol, from which this play was adapted. It shows sympathy for the struggles of the poor. That's like a recurring theme throughout it. The story is set in England during the 19th century, which is the 1800s, a time of rapid industrial growth. And in this booming economy, the wealthy lived in luxury, but the poor and the working class suffered. So that hasn't really changed too much. All right, so there's a long cast of characters here. And we come down and it'll give us uh, the place and the time that this takes place in. So the place is various locations in and around the city of London, which is in England, including Scrooge's chambers and offices, the Cratchit home, Fred's home, Scrooge's school, Fezziwig's offices, Old Joe's hideaway. So it's giving you like the major places that um, occur, or that like this takes place in. The time of the play, which is the entire action of the play, um, takes place on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, in the morning after Christmas, 1843. All right, so it's all taking place within like a three-day period. So it starts on scene one. The little italic things inside of the brackets are uh, stage directions. They kind of set up like how this should be shown and if it was like being produced. Ghostly music and auditorium, a single spotlight on Jacob Marley. Uh, downstage center, DC stands for downstage center. It gives you like where they should be on the stage. He is ancient, awful, dead eyed. He speaks straight out to the auditorium. Marley, cackle voice, like how he should say this. My name is Jacob Marley, and I am dead. He laughs. Oh, no. There's no doubt that I am dead. The register of my burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and by my chief mourner, Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> I am dead as a doornail. A spotlight fades up, stage right, on Scrooge, and his counting house counting. Lettering on the window behind Scrooge reads Scrooge and Marley LTD. The spotlight is tight on Scrooge's head and shoulders. We should not yet see into the offices and setting. Ghostly music continues under. Marley looks across at Scrooge, pitifully, after a moment's pause. I present him to you, Ebenezer Scrooge, England's most tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him freezes his old features, nips his pointed nose, shrivels his cheek, stiffens his gait, makes his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and speaks out shrewdly in his grating voice. Look at him. Look at him. Scrooge counts and mumbles. They owe me money, and I will collect. I'll have them jailed if I have to. They owe me money, and I will collect what is due me. Marley moves towards Scrooge, two steps. The spotlight stays with him. Marley, disgusted. He and I were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was my sole executor, my sole administrator, my sole assign, my sole residuary legatee, my sole friend, and my sole mourner. But Scrooge was not so cut up by the sad event of my death. 
but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of my funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. <laughs> he never painted out my name from the window. There it stands on the window and above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to our business call him Scrooge, and sometimes they call him Marley. He answers to both names. It's all the same to him. And it's cheaper than painting in a new sign, isn't it? He pauses and moves closer to Scrooge. Nobody has ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children ever ask him, What it is, O'Clock? No man or woman now or ever in his life, not once, inquire the way to such and such a place. Marley stands next to Scrooge now. They share, so it seems, a spotlight. But what does Scrooge care of any of this? It is the very things he likes to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. So we'll pause. So Scrooge is so terrible that people don't ask him what time it is. They don't ask him for directions. They stay away from him. He's such a miserable person on the inside that the outside features, his nose, his cheeks, they've morphed to make him unpleasant looking because his personality is so bad. That's like the type of person he is. It is a, a miserable person. A ghostly bell rings in the distance. Marley moves away from Scrooge, now heading downstage again. As he does, he takes the light. Scrooge has disappeared into the black void beyond. Marley walks downstage center, talking directly to the audience, and pauses. The bell tolls, and I must take my leave. You must stay a while with Scrooge and watch him play out his Scroogey life. It is now the story, the once upon a time. Scrooge is busy in his counting house. Where else? Christmas Eve and Scrooge is busy in his counting house. It is cold, bleak, biting weather outside, foggy with all. And if you listen closely, you can hear the people in the court go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The clock outside strikes three. Only three, and quite dark outside already. It has not been light all day this day. This ghostly bell rings in the distance again. Marley looks about him, music in. Marley flies away. Note well, Marley's comings and goings should, from time to time, induce the explosion of the odd flash pot. So like a little stage thing that, that directs light should come in and out. Scene two. Christmas music in, sung by a live chorus full. So there should be like lots of people there. At conclusion of song, sound fades under and into the distance. Lights up and set. Offices of Scrooge and Marley LTD. Scrooge sits at his desk at work. Near him is a tiny fire. His door is open, and in his line of vision, we see Scrooge's clerk, Bob Cratchit, who sits in a dismal tank of a cubicle, copying letters. Near Cratchit is a fire so tiny as to barely cast a light. Perhaps it's like one pitifully glowing coal. Cratchit rubs his hands together and puts on a white comforter and tries to heat his hands around his candle. Scrooge's nephew enters unseen. What are you doing, Cratchit? Acting cold, are you? Next, you'll be asking to replenish your coal from my coal box, won't you? Well, save your breath, Cratchit, unless you're prepared to find employ elsewhere. The nephew cheerfully surprising Scrooge. A Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. God save you. Bah! Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. I'm sure you don't mean that. I do. Merry Christmas. 
What right do you have to be married? What reason have you to be married? You're poor enough. Come then, what right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Bah, humbug. Don't be cross, uncle. What else can I be, eh? When I live in a world of fools such as this? Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time of paying bills without any money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, nephew, you keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, uncle. Let me leave it alone then. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure I always thought of Christmas time when it has come around. Did I dare say? Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure that I always thought of Christmas time when it has come around as a good time. The only time I know of when men and women seem to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on others' journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done, that it has done me good and that it will do me good. And I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank applauds and looks at the furious Scrooge and pokes out his tiny fire, as if in exchange for the moment of impropriety. Scrooge yells at him. Scrooge to the clerk. Let me hear another sound from you and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. To the nephew. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Oh, don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. I'd rather see myself dead than see myself with your family. But why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. That, sir, is the only thing you have said to me in your entire lifetime, which is even more ridiculous than Merry Christmas. He turns from nephew. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, you never came to see me before I married either. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, nephew. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute, but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. He stands facing Scrooge. Uncle, you are the most... No, I shan't. Chris, my Christmas humor is intact. God bless you, Uncle. The nephew turns and starts for the door, and he stops at Cratchit's cage. Merry Christmas, Bob Cratchit. A Merry Christmas to you, sir, and a very, very happy New Year. Scrooge calling after across to them. Oh, fine. A perfection, just fine, to see the perfect pair of you, husbands with wives and children to support, my clerk there earning 15 shillings a week, and the perfect pair of you talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. He's impossible. Oh, mind him not, sir. He's getting on in years, and he's alone. He's noticed your visit, and I'll wager your visit has warmed him. Him? Uncle Ebenezer Scrooge? Warmed? You are a better Christian than I am, sir. Cratchit opening the door for nephew. Two do-gooders will enter as nephew exits. Good day to you, sir, and God bless. 
God bless. One man who enters is portly, the other is thin. Both are pleasant. Can I help you, gentlemen? Thin man carrying papers and books looks around Cratch to Scrooge. Uh, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Oh, we have no doubt this liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. He offers his calling card. Scrooge, handing back the card, unlooked at. Good afternoon. Uh, this will take but a moment, sir. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provisions for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And aren't the Union workhouses still in operation? They are, but still I wish that I could say they are not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then? Both very serious, or both very busy, sir. Oh, I see. I was afraid from what you said first that something had occurred to stop them from their useful course. I'm glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and, and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt. And abundance rejoices. He has his pen in hand as well as a notepad. What shall I put you down for, sir? Nothing. You wish to be left anonymous? I wish to be left alone. He pauses and turns away and turns back to them. But since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I help to support the establishments that I have mentioned. They cost enough. And those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business, and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Scrooge turns his back on the gentleman, returns to his desk. But sir, Mr. Scrooge, think of the poor. Sc Scrooge turns suddenly to them and pauses. Take your leave of my offices, sirs, while I am still smiling. The thin man looks at the portly man, and they are undone. They shrug, and they move to the door. Cratchit hops up to open it for them. Good day, sir, to Cratchit. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Yes, a Merry Christmas to both of you. Merry Christmas. Cratchit silently squeezes something into the hand of the thin man. What's this? Shh. Cratchit opens the door. Wind and snow whistle into the room. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Cratchit closes the door and returns to his workplace. Scrooge at his own counting table. He talks to Cratchit without looking up. It's less of a time of year for being merry and more of a time of year for being loony, if you ask me. Well, I don't know, sir. The clock's bell strikes six o'clock. <laughs> well, there it is, eh? Six. Saved by six bells, are you? I must be going home. He snuffs out his candle and puts on his hat. I hope you have a very, very lovely day tomorrow, sir. Hmm. Oh, you'll be wanting the whole day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. 
Cratchit smiles faintly. I don't know, sir. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day wages for no work. It's only but once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. Oh, I, I will, sir. I will, I, I promise you. And sir, don't say it, Cratchit. But, but let me wish you a... Don't say it, Cratchit. I warn you. Sir? Cratchit! Cratchit opens the door. All right. All right then, sir. Well, Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge! And he runs out the door, shutting it behind him. Scrooge moves to his desk, gathering his coat, hat, etc. A boy appears at his window, singing, Away in a manger. Scrooge seizes his ruler and whacks at the image of the boy outside. The boy leaves. Bah! Humbug! He shuts out the light. And there's a note on the crossover following scene two. Scrooge will walk alone to his rooms from his offices as he makes a long, slow cross of the stage. The scenery should change. Christmas music will be heard. Various people will cross by Scrooge, often smiling happily. There will be occasional ple pleasant greetings tossed at him. Scrooge, in contrast to all, will grump and mumble. He will snap at passing boys as might a horrid old hound. In short, Scrooge's sounds and movements will define him in contrast from all the other people who cross the stage. He is the misanthrope, the malcontent, the miser. He is Scrooge. This statement of Scrooge's character, by contrast to all the other characters, should seem comical to the audience. So, like, he's so terrible, it's, like, clear and evident, like, that he's, like, an animal. During Scrooge's crossover to his room, snow shall begin to fall. All passers-by will hold their faces to the sky, smiling, allowing snow to shower them lightly. Scrooge, by contrast, will bat at the flakes with his walking stick, as might an insomniac swat at a sleep-stopping, middle-of-the-night swarm of mosquitoes. He will comment on the blackness of the night and finally reach his rooms in his encounter with the magical specter, Marley, his eternal mate. Scene three. No light at all. No moon. That is what is at the center of Christmas Eve. Dead black. Void. Scrooge puts his key in the door's keyhole. He has reached his rooms now. The door knocker changes and is now Marley's face. So there's like a magical transformation. A musical sound. Quickly. Ghostly. Marley's image is not at all angry, but looks at Scrooge as did the old Marley look at Scrooge. The hair is curiously stirred, eyes wide open, dead, absent of focus. Scrooge stares wordlessly here. The face before his very eyes does deliquesce into a knocker again. Scrooge opens the door and checks the back of the same, probably for Marley's pigtail. Seeing nothing but screws and nuts, Scrooge refuses the memory. Poo, poo. The sound of the door closing resounds throughout the house as thunder. Every room echoes the sound. Scrooge fastens the door and walks across the hall to the stairs, trimming his candle as he goes. And then he goes slowly up the staircase. He checks each room, sitting room, bedrooms, lumber room. He looks under the sofa, under the table, nobody there. He fixes his evening gruel on the hob and changes his jacket. Scrooge sits near the tiny, low-flamed fire, sipping his gruel. There are various pictures on the walls. All of them now show likeness of Marley. Scrooge blinks his eyes, so all the pictures change to this picture of Marley. Ma, Humbug! Scrooge walks in a circle about the room. The pictures change back into their natural images. He sits at the table in front of the fire. A bell hangs overhead. It begins to ring of its own accord. Slowly, surely, begins the ringing of every bell in the house. The continue ringing for nearly half a minute. Scrooge is stunned by the phenomenon. The bells cease their ringing all at once. 
deep below Scrooge in the basement of the house, there is the sound of clanking, of some enormous chain being dragged across the floors. And now up the stairs, we hear doors flying open, so there's this clunking, clanking sound of a chain. Bah! Still! Humbug still! This is not happening. I won't believe it. Marley's ghost enters the room. He is horrible to look at. Pigtail, vest, suit as usual. But he drags an enormous chain now, to which is fastened cash boxes, and keys, and padlocks, and ledgers, and deeds, and heavy persons fashioned of steel. He is transparent. Marley stands opposite the stricken Scrooge. How now? What do you want of me? Much. Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your business partner, Jacob Marley. Uh, I see. Can you sit down? I can. Do it, then. I shall. Marley sits opposite Scrooge in the chair across the table at the front of the fireplace. You don't believe in me. I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because every little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef. A blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. There is silence between them. Scrooge is made nervous by it. He picks up a toothpick. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. Marley opens his mouth and screams a ghostly, fearful scream. The scream echoes about each room of the house. Bats fly, cats screech, lightning flashes. Scrooge stands and walks backwards against the wall. Marley stands and screams again. This time, he takes his head and lifts it from his shoulders. His head continues to scream, so he decapitates himself and holds up his own head. Marley's face again appears on every picture in the room, all screaming. Scrooge is on his knees before Marley. Mercy! Dreadful apparition! Mercy! Why, oh why? Why do you trouble me so? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? It, it, why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. Marley screams again, a tragic scream from his ghostly bones. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. Is its pattern strange to you? Or would you know? You, Scrooge, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself. It was full as heavy and long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Terrified that a chain will appear about his body, Scrooge spins and waves the unwanted chain away. None, of course, appears. He sees Marley watching him dance about the room. Marley watches Scrooge silently. Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. Comfort comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, 
and is convey conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. A very little more is all that is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. He moans again. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Screams, word, business. A flashpot explodes with him. Business! Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity and mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. Scrooge is quaking. Hear me, Ebenezer Scrooge. My time is nearly done. I will, but don't be hard upon me. And don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. How is it that I appear before you in a shape that you can see? I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. That is no light part of my penance. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance in hope of escaping my fate. A chance in hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Would that be the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first one tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and, and get it over, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night, and when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate, look to see me no more. Others may, but you may not. And look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. Marley places his head back upon his shoulders. He approaches the window and beckons to Scrooge to watch. Outside the window, specters fly by, carrying money boxes and chains. They make a confused sound of lamentation. Marley, after listening a moment, joins in their mournful dirge. He leans to the window and floats out into the bleak, dark night. He is gone. Scrooge rushing to the window. Jacob! No! Jacob! Don't leave me! I'm frightened. He sees that Marley has gone. He looks outside. He pulls the shutter closed that the scene is blocked from his view. All sound stops. After a pause, he reopens the shutter and all is quiet, as it should be on Christmas Eve. Carolers carol out of doors in the distance. Scrooge closes the shutter and walks down the stairs. He examines the door by which Marley first entered. No one here at all. Did I imagine all that? Humbug! He looks about the room. I, I did imagine it. It only happened in my, my foulest dream mind, didn't it? An undigested bit of... Thunder and lightning in the room, suddenly. Sorry! Sorry! There is silence again. The lights fade out. Scene 4 Christmas music, choral. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, sung by an onstage choir of children, spotlighted downstage center. Above, Scrooge in his bed, dead to the world, asleep in his darkened room. 
it should appear that the choir is singing somewhere outside of the house, of course, and use of scrim is thus suggested. When the singing is ended, the choir should fade out of view, and Marley should fade into view in their place. Marley, directly to the audience. From this point forth, I shall be quite visible to you, but invisible to him. He smiles. He will feel my presence nevertheless, for unless my senses fail me completely, we are, you and I, witness to the changing of a miser. That one, my partner in life, in business and in eternity, that one Scrooge. He moves to staircase below Scrooge. See him now. He endeavors to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes. To the audience. See him now. He listens for the hour. The bells toll and Scrooge is awakened and quakes as the hour approaches one o'clock. But the bells stop their sound at the hour of twelve. Scrooge, astonished. Midnight. This isn't possible. It was past two when I went to bed. An icicle must have gotten into the clock's works. I couldn't have slept through the whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything has happened to the sun. This is twelve at noon. He runs to window and unshutters the same. It is night. Night. Still. Quiet. Normal for the season. Cold. It is certainly not noon. I cannot in any way afford to lose my days. Securities come due. Promissory notes, interest on investments. These are things that happen in the daylight. He returns to his bed. Was this a dream? Marley appears in his room. He speaks to the audience. You see, he does not, with faith, believe in me fully. Even still, whatever will it take to turn the faith of a miser? from money to men. Another quarter, now it'll be one, and Marley's ghostly friends will come. He pauses and listens. Where's the chime for one? Ding dong. A quarter past. It repeats. Ding dong. Ha half past. Ding dong. A quarter to it. But where is the heavy bell of old hour one? This is a game in which I lose my senses. Perhaps if I allowed myself another short doze. Doze, Ebenezer, doze. A heavy bell thuds its one ring. Dull and definitely one o'clock. There is a flash of light. Scrooge sits up in a sudden... A hand draws back the curtains by his bed. He sees it. A hand. Who owns it? Hello? Ghostly music again, but of a new nature to the play. A strange figure stands before Scrooge, like a child, yet at the same time like an old man. White hair, but unwrinkled skin. Long, muscular arms, but delicate legs and feet. It wears a white tunic with a lustrous belt and cinches the waist. Branches of fresh green holly in its hand, but has its dress trimmed with fresh summer flowers. Clear jets of light spring from the crown of its head. Holds its cap in his hand. The spirit is called past. Are you the spirit, sir, whose Coming was foretold to me. I am. Does, does he take this to be a vision of his green grocer? Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? Your past. 
May I ask, please, sir, what business you have here with me? Your welfare. Not to sound ungrateful, sir, and really, please do understand that I'm plenty obliged for your concern, but really, conspiracy. It would have done all the better for my welfare to have been left alone altogether, to have slept peacefully through this night. Your reclamation, then. Take heed. My what? Passed, motioning to Scrooge and taking his arm. Rise. Fly with me. He leads Scrooge to the window. Scrooge, panicked. Fly, but I'm a mortal and cannot fly past, pointing to his heart. Bear but in touch of my hand there, here, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Scrooge touches the spirit's heart, and the light dissolve into sparkly flickers. Lovely crystals of music are heard. The scene dissolves into another. Christmas music again. Scene five. Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past walk together across an open stage. In the background, we see a field that is open, covered by a soft, downy snow, a country road. Good, good heaven! I was bred in this place! I was a boy here! Scrooge freezes, staring at the field beyond. Marley's ghost appears beside him and take Scrooge's face in his hands and turn his face to the audience. You see this Scrooge, stricken by feeling, conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and care, long, long forgotten. This one, this Scrooge, before your very eyes, returns to life among the living. To the audience sternly, you'd best pay your most careful attention. I would suggest rapt. There is a small flash and a puff of smoke, and Marley is gone again. Your lip is trembling, Mr. Scrooge. And what is that upon your cheek? Uh, upon my cheek, nothing. Uh, a blemish on the skin from the eating of overmuch grease. Nothing. Suddenly. Kind spirit of Christmas past, lead me where you will. But quickly, to be stagnant in this place is, for me, unbearable. You recollect the way. R remember it. I would know it blindfolded. My bridge, my church, my winding river. He staggers about, trying to see it all at once. He weeps again. These are but shadows of things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. Four jockin' travelers enter, singing a Christmas song in four-part harmony. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Listen, I know these men. I remember the beauty of their song. But why do you remember it so happily? Is it, it is Merry Christmas that they say to one another. What is Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, right? What good has Merry Christmas ever done you, Mr. Scrooge? After a long pause. None. No good. None. He bows his head. Look you, sir. A school ahead. The schoolroom is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there. Still. Scrooge falls to the ground, sobbing as he sees, and we see, a small boy, the young Scrooge, sitting and weeping, bravely, alone at his desk, alone in a vast space, a void. I cannot look at him. You must, Mr. Scrooge. You must. It's 
me. He pauses and weeps. Poor boy. He lived inside his head alone. He pauses and weeps. Poor boy. He pauses and stops his weeping. I wish. He dries his eyes on his cuff. Ah, it's too late. What is the matter? There was a boy singing a Christmas carol outside my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. The past smiles and waves his hand to Scrooge. Come, let us see another Christmas. The lights out on a little boy, a flash of light, a puff of smoke. Now lights up on an older boy. Look, me, again, older now. He realizes. Oh, yes, still alone. The boy, a slightly older Scrooge, sits alone in a chair, reading. The door to the room opens and a young girl enters. She is much younger than his slightly older Scrooge. She is, say, six and he's, say, twelve. Older Scrooge and the Ghost of Christmas Past stand, watching the scene, unseen. Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home. Home, little fan? Yes. Home for good and, and all. Father is so much kinder than he ever used to be, and home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should. And he sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man and are never to come back here. But first, we're to be together all the Christmas long, and... Have the merriest time in the world. You're quite a woman, little fan. Laughing, she drags that boy, causing him to stumble to the door with her. Suddenly, we hear a mean and terrible voice in the hallway. Off stage, it is the schoolmaster. Bring down Master Scrooge's travel box at once. He is to travel. Who's that, Ebenezer? Oh, quiet fan the schoolmaster himself. The door burst open and into the room burst with it, the schoolmaster. Master Scrooge! Oh, schoolmaster, I'd like you to meet my little sister, Fan, sir. Two boys struggle on with Scrooge's trunk. Please, sir, she curtsies. You are to travel, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, yes, sir, I, I know, sir. All start to exit, but Fan grabs the coattails of the mean old schoolmaster. Fan! What's this? Pardon, sir, but I believe that you've forgotten to say your goodbye to my brother, Ebenezer, who stands still now awaiting it. She smiles and curtsies and lowers her eyes. Pardon, sir. The schoolmaster, amazed. I, uh, her, her umph, uh, well then, he outstretches his hand. Goodbye, Scrooge. Um, well, goodbye, schoolmaster. Lights fade out on all but boy looking at Fan and Scrooge looking past, uh, and past looking at them. Oh, my dear, dear little sister. Fan, how I loved her. Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered, but she had a large heart. So she had. She died a woman, and had, as I think, children? One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. Fine, then. We move on, Mr. Scrooge. That warehouse there? Do you know it? Know it? Wasn't I apprenticed there? We'll have a look. They entered the warehouse. The lights cross fade with them. 
coming up on an old man in Welsh wig. Fezziwig. Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart. It's Fezziwig, alive again. Fezziwig sits behind a large high desk counting. He lays down his pen and looks at the clock. Seven bells sound. Quitting time. Quitting time. He takes off his waistcoat and laughs, calling off. Yo-ho, Ebenezer, Dick. Dick Wilkins and Ebenezer Scrooge, a young version, enter the room. Dick and Ebenezer are Fezziwig's apprentices. Dick Wilkins, to be sure. My fellow prentice. Bless my soul, yes. There he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. They stand in attention in front of Fezziwig, laughing. Hilly-ho! Clear away, let's have room here. Hilly-ho, Dick! Cheer up, Ebenezer! The young men clear the room, sweep the floor, straighten the pictures, trim the lamps, etc. The space is clear now. A fiddler enters fiddling. Hi-ho, Matthew! Fiddle away! Where are my daughters? The fiddler plays, and three young daughters of Fezziwig enter, followed by six young adult male suitors. They are dancing to the music, and all employees come in. Workers, clerks, housemaids, cousins, the baker, etc. They all dance. A full number is wanted here. Throughout the dance, food is brought to the feast. It is eaten in dance by the dancers. Ebenezer dances with all three of the daughters, as does Dick. They compete for the daughters happily in the dance. Fezziwig dances with his daughters. Fezziwig dances with Dick and Ebenezer. The music changes and Mrs. Fezziwig enters. She lovingly scolds her husband. They dance. She dances with Ebenezer, lifting him and throwing him about. She is enormously fat. When the dance is ended, they all dance off, floating away, as does the music. Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past stand alone now. The music is gone. It was a small matter that Fezziwig made those silly folks so full of gratitude? Small? Shh. Lights up on Dick and Ebenezer. We are blessed, Ebenezer, truly to have such a master as Mr. Fezziwig. He is the best, the best, the very and absolute best. If I ever own a firm of my own, I shall treat my apprentices with the same dignity and the same grace. We have learned a wonderful lesson from this, Master Dick. Ah, that's a fact, Ebenezer, that's a fact. Was it not a small matter, really? He spent but a few pounds of his mortal money on your small party. Three or four pounds, perhaps? Is that so much that he deserves such praise as you and Dick so lavish now? It isn't that. It isn't that, spirit. Fezziwig had the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. The happiness he gave is quite as great as, as if it cost him a fortune. What is the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. Ebenezer enters the room and shuts down all the lamps. He stretches and yawns. The ghost of Christmas past turns to Scrooge all of a sudden. My time grows short. Quick. In a flash of light, Ebenezer is gone, and in his place stands an older Scrooge. This one, a man in the prime of his life. Beside him stands a young woman in a mourning dress. She's crying. She speaks to the man with hostility. It matters little to you, very little. Another idol has displaced me. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is an even-handed dealing of the world. There's nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there's nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. 
Have I not seen your noble aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you? Have I not? No. No. What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? Have I changed towards you? No. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was not another man. I, I was a boy. Your own feelings tell that you were not what you are. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. No. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Don't release me, madam. Have I ever sought release? In words, no, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this has never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Ah, no. Ah, yes. You think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could, heaven knows. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You who in your very confidence with her weight everything by gain or choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Please, I, I, please, I, I, please, you may, the memory of what is past half makes me hope you will, have pain in this, a, a very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the memory of it as an unprofitable dream from which it happened, well, that you awoke. May you be happy in the life that you have chosen for yourself. No. Yourself. Alone. No. Goodbye, Ebenezer. Don't let her go. Goodbye. No. She exit, and Scrooge goes to younger man himself. You fool. You mindless loon. You fool. The man to exit woman. Fool. Mindless loon. Fool. Don't say that. Spirit, remove me from this place. I have told you these were shadows of the things that have been. They are what they are. Do not blame me, Mr. Scrooge. Remove me. I cannot bear it. The faces of all who appeared in the scene are now projected for a moment around the stage. Enormous, flimsy, silent. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no more longer! Or haunt me no longer. There's a sudden flash of light, a flare. The ghost of Christmas past is gone. Scrooge is for the moment alone on stage. His bed is turned down across the stage. A small candle burns now in Scrooge's hand. There's a child's cap in his other hand. He slowly crosses the stage to his bed to sleep. Marley appears behind Scrooge, who continues his long, elderly cross to bed. Marley speaks directly to the audience. Housiness caused by the recognition of what was. The cap he carries is from ten lives past. His boyhood cap donned atop a hopeful hairy head, askew, perhaps, or at a rakish angle, doth now in honor of regrets. 
perhaps even too heavy to carry in his present state of weak remorse. Scrooge drops the cap. He lies atop his bed. He sleeps to audience. He sleeps. For him, there's even more trouble ahead. For you, the playhouse tells me there's hot cider, as should be your anticipation for the specter Christmas present and future. For I promise you both. So I pray you hurry back to your seats, refreshed and ready for a miser to turn his coat of gray into a blazing Christmas holly red. A flash of lightning, a clap of thunder, bats fly, ghostly music. Marley is gone. And so at the end, this is that promise of the turning point, that the coat of gray, as he said, is going to turn into that Christmas holly red, that things have shifted or changed, that the trajectory of his life, which we agree is going towards ghostly with all the big chains and heavy boxes, that that's currently where it was going. But hopefully because of the ghost, it's going to shift. And, and that's what we'll see in the next act. Act two. Scene one, lights, choral music is sung, curtain, Scrooge in bed sleeping in spotlight. We cannot yet see the interior of his room. Marley opposite and spotlight equal to Scrooge's. Marley laughs. He tosses his hand in the air and flames shoot from it magically into the air. There's a thunderclap and then another, a lightning flash and then another. Ghostly music plays under. Colors change. Marley's spotlight has gone out and now reappears with Marley in it, standing next to the bed and sleeping Scrooge. Marley addresses the audience directly. Hear the snoring Scrooge, sleeping to escape the nightmare that is his waking day. What shall I bring to him now? I'm afraid nothing would astonish old Scrooge now, not after what he's seen. Not a baby boy, not a rhinoceros, nor anything in between would astonish Ebenezer Scrooge. Just now? I can think of nothing. <gasps> That's it. Nothing. He speaks confidently. I'll have the clock strike one, and when he awakes expecting my second messenger, there'll be no one. Nothing. Then I'll have the bell strike twelve, and then once again... And then nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing will astonish him. I think it will work. The bell tolls one and Scrooge leaps awake. One, one, this is it, time. He looks about the room. Nothing. The bell tolls midnight. Midnight? How could this be? I'm sleeping backwards. One again. Good heavens! One again! I'm sleeping back and forth. A pause, and Scrooge looks about. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Suddenly, thunder and lightning. Marley laughs and disappears. The room shakes and glows. There is suddenly spring like music. Scrooge makes a run for the door. Scrooge! What stay you put? Just checking to see if anyone's in here. Lights and thunder again. More music. Marley is of a sudden gone. In his place sits the ghost of Christmas present. To be called in the stage directions of the play, present. Center of room. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne or turkeys and geese game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that make the chamber dim with their delicious steam. Upon his throne sits present, glorious to see. He bears a torch shaped as a horn of plenty. 
Scrooge hops out of the door and then peeks back into his bedroom. Present calls to Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge, come in, come in, come in and know me better. Hello, how should I call you? I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Present is wearing a simple green robe. The walls around the room are now covered in greenery as well. The room seems to be a perfect grove now. Leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflect the stage lights. Suddenly, there is a mighty roar of flame in the fireplace, and now the hearth burns with a lavish, warming fire. There is an ancient scabbard girdling the ghost's middle, but without sword. The sheath is gone to rust. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. You have never walked forth with young... Oh, yeah, you have never walked forth with younger members of my family. My elder brothers born on Christmas's past? I don't think I have. I'm afraid I have not. Have, have you had many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800. Oh, a tremendous family to provide for. Present stands. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge walks cautiously to present and touches his robe. When he does, lightning flashes, thunder claps, music plays, blackout. Scene two. Prologue. Marley stands spotlit, left stage. He speaks directly to the audience. My ghostly friend now leads my living part leads my living partner through the city streets. Lights up on Scrooge and present. See them there and hear the music people make when the weather is severe as it is now. Winter music. Choral group behind the screen sings. When the song is done and the stage is reset, the lights will fade up on a row of shops behind the singers. The choral group will hum the song they have just completed now and mill about the streets, carrying their dinners to the baker shops and restaurants. They will perhaps sing about being poor at Christmas time, whatever. These revelers, Mr. Scrooge, carry their own dinners to their jobs, where they will work to bake the meals the rich men and women of the city will eat as their Christmas dinners. Generous people, these, to care for the others so. Present walks among the choral group, and a sparkling incense falls from his torch onto their baskets as he pulls the covers off of the baskets. Some of the choral group become angry with each other. Hey, you, watch where you're going. Watch it yourself, mate. Present sprinkles them directly, and they change. I pray, go in ahead of me. It's, it's Christmas. You be first. No, no, I must insist, you be first. All right, I shall be, and gratefully so. The pleasure is equally mine for being able to watch you pass, smiling. I would find it a shame to quarrel on Christmas Day, as would I. Merry Christmas, then, friend, and a Merry Christmas straight back to you. Church bells toll. The choral group enters the buildings, the shops and restaurants. They exit the stage, shutting their doors closed behind them. All sound stops. Scrooge and Present are alone again. What is it in what is it you sprinkle from your torch? Kindness. Do you sprinkle your kindness on any particular people or all people? To any person kindly given, and to the very poor most of all. Why to the very poor most? Because the very poor need it most. Touch my heart. Here, Mr. Scrooge, we have another journey. Scrooge touches the ghost's heart and music plays. Lights change color. Lightning flashes thunder claps. A choral group appears in the street singing Christmas carols. Scene three. 
Marley stands spotlit in front of a scrim on which is painted the exterior of Cratchit's four-roomed house. There is a flash and a clap, and Marley is gone. The light shift color again, and the scrim flies away. And we are in the interior of the Cratchit family home. Scrooge is there with the spirit, present, watching Mrs. Cratchit set the table, with the help of Belinda Cratchit and Peter Cratchit. A baby. Pokes a fork in the mashed potatoes on his high chair's tray. He also chews on his shirt collar. What is this place, spirit? This is the home of your employee, Mr. Scrooge. Don't you know it? Do you mean Cratchit, spirit? Do you mean this is Cratchit's home? None other. These children are his. There are more to come presently. On his meager earnings? What foolishness! Foolishness, is it? Wouldn't you say so? Fifteen shillings a week's what he gets. I would say that he gets the pleasure of his family fifteen times a week, times the number of hours a day. Wait, Mr. Scrooge. Wait, listen, and watch. You might actually learn something. What has ever got your precious father, then? And your brother, Tiny Tim? And Martha weren't as late last Christmas by half an hour. Martha opens the door, speaking to her mother as she does. Here's Martha now, mother! She laughs. The Cratchit children squeal with delight. It's Martha, mother! Heller's Martha! Martha, mama! Martha, mama! Hello! Hooray! Martha! Martha! There's such an enormous goose for us, Martha! Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. We'd a great deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind so long as you are come. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming. Hide, Martha, hide. Martha giggles and hides herself. Where, here? Hi, hide. Not there, there. Martha is hidden, and Bob Cratchit enters, carrying Tiny Tim atop his shoulder. He wears a threadbare and fringeless comforter hanging down in front of him. Tiny Tim carries small crutches, and his small legs are bound in an iron frame brace. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, is my love. Merry Christmas, Peter. Merry Christmas, Belinda. Why, where's Martha? Not coming. Not coming. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha pokes her head out. Oh, poor father, don't be disappointed. What's this? Tis I, Martha. They embrace. Martha, Martha. Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim is placed in Martha's arms. Belinda and Peter rush him off stage. Come, brother, you must come hear the pudding singing in the copper. The pudding? What flavor have we? Plum, plum. Oh, mother, I love plum. The children exit the stage giggling. And how did little tiny or little Tim behave? As good as gold, and even better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. He has the oddest ideas sometimes, but he seems all the while to be grown stronger and, and, and more hardy. One would never know. He hears Tim's crutch on floor outside door. The goose has arrived to be eaten. Oh, Mama, Mama, it's beautiful. It's a perfect goose, Mother. To this Christmas goose, Mother and Father, I say, Hooray! 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 The family sits around the table. Bob and Mrs. Cratchit serve the trimmings quickly. All sit, all bow heads, and all pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for your many gifts, our dear children, our wonderful meal, 
our love for one another and the warmth of our small fire. He looks up at all. A Merry Christmas to us, my dear. God bless us. Merry Christmas. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. All freeze and spotlight on present and Scrooge. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, in a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge bows his head. We hear Bomb's voice speak Scrooge's name. Mr. Scrooge. Huh. What's that? Who calls? Bob, his glass raised in a toast. I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Me. Bob, you toast me? Save your breath, Mr. Scrooge. You can't be seen or heard. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I'd had him here, that miser Scrooge. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he had a good appetite for it. My dear. Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. Oh, spirit, must I? You know he is, Robert. No one knows it better than you do, poor fellow. This is Christmas Day, and I should like to drink to the health of the man who employs me and allows me to earn my living and our support, and that man is Ebenezer Scrooge. I'll drink to his health for your sake and the days, but not for his sake. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you, Mr. Scrooge, wherever you may be this day. Just here, kind madam. Out of sight. Out of sight. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And Mrs. Cratchit, too. No one else is toasting me. Not now, not ever. Of that, I am sure. Children, Merry Christmas to Mr. Scrooge. I'll pay you sixpence, Tim, for my favorite song. Oh, Father, I'd so love to sing it, but not for pay. This Christmas goose, this feast, you and mother, my brother and sisters close with me. That's my pay. Martha, will you play the notes on the lute for Tiny Tim's song? May I sing too, Father? We'll all sing. They sing a song about a tiny child lost in the snow, probably from Wordsworth's poem. Tim sings the lead vocal, all chime in for the chorus. Their song fades under as the ghost of Christmas present speaks. Mark my words, Ebenezer Scrooge. I do not present the Cratchits to you because they are handsome or brilliant family. They are not handsome. They are not brilliant. They are not well-dressed or tasteful to the times. Their shoes are not even waterproofed by virtue of money or cleverness spent. So when the pavement is wet, so are the insides of their shoes and the tops of their toes. These are the Cratchits, Mr. Scrooge. They are not highly special. They are happy, grateful, pleased with one another, contented with the time and how it passes. They don't sing very well, do they? But nonetheless, they do sing. Think of that, Scrooge. Fifteen shillings a week, and they do sing. Hear their song until its end. I am listening. 
The chorus sings full volume now until the song ends here. Spirit, it must be time for us to take our leave. I feel in my heart that it is, and I must think on that which I have seen here. Touch my robe again. Scrooge touches President's robe. The lights fade on the Cratchits who sit frozen at the table. Scrooge and President in the spotlight now. Thunder, lightning, smoke, they are gone. Scene four. Marley appears downstage left in its single spotlight. A storm brews. Thunder and lightning. Scrooge and present fly past, upstage. The storm continues furiously, and now and again Scrooge and present will zip past in their travels. Marley will speak straight out to the audience. The ghost of Christmas present. My co-worker in this attempt to turn a miser flies about now with that very miser Scrooge from street to street. And he points out partygoers on their way to Christmas parties. If one were to judge from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, one might think no one was left at home to give anyone welcome. But that's not the case, is it? Every home is expecting company. <laughs> Scrooge is amazed. Scrooge and present zip past again. The lights fade up around them. We're in the nephew's home in the living room. Present and Scrooge stand watching the nephew, Fred, and his wife fixing the fire. What's this place? We've moved from the mines. You do not recognize them. It's my nephew and the one he married. Marley waves his hand, and there is a lightning flash. He disappears. <laughs> it strikes me so funny to think of what he said. That Christmas was a humbug. <laughs> As I live, he believed it. More shame for him, Fred. Well, he's a comical old fellow. That's the truth. I have no patience for him. Oh, I have. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. It's me they talk of, isn't it, spirit? Here, wife, consider this. Uncle Scrooge takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? Oh, you're sweet to say what I think you're about to say, too, Fred. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner by it, I can tell you that. Oh, Fred. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner. Ask my sisters or your bachelor friend, Topper. Ask any of them. They'll tell you what old Scrooge, your uncle missed, a dandy meal. Well, that's something of a relief, wife. Glad to hear it. He hugs his wife. They laugh. They kiss. The truth is, he misses much yet. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. Nay, he is my only uncle, and I feel for the old miser. But I tell you, wife, I see my dear and perfect mother's face on his wizened cheeks and brow. Brother and sister they were, and I cannot erase that from each view of him I take. I understand what you say, Fred, and I'm with you in your yearly asking. But he will never accept, you know. He never will. Well, true, wife. Uncle may rail at Christmas till he dies, and I think I shook him some with my visit today. <laughs> I refuse to grow angry, no matter how nasty he became. Whoop! It was he who grew angry, wife. They both laugh now. What he says is true, spirit. Bah! Humbug! <laughs> Ah, there's much laughter in our marriage, wife. It pleases me. You please me. And you please me, Fred. You are a good man. They embrace. Come now. We must have a look at the meal. Our guests will arrive soon. My sisters. Topper. A toast first. He hands her a glass. A toast to Uncle Scrooge. He fills their glasses. A toast to him? 
Uncle Scrooge has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, and it would be ungrateful not to drink to his health. And I say, Uncle Scrooge! <laughs> You're a proper loon, Fred, and I'm a proper wife to you. She raises her glass. Uncle Scrooge! They drink, they embrace, they kiss. Spirit, please make me visible. Make me audible. I want to talk with my nephew and my niece. He calls out to them. The lights that light the room and Fred and wife fade out. Scrooge and present are alone, spotlit. These shadows are gone to you now, Mr. Scrooge. You may return to them later tonight in your dreams. My time grows short, Ebenezer Scrooge. Look you on me. Do you see how I've aged? Your hair has gone gray, your skin wrinkled. Our spirits' lives so short. My stay upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight. At midnight. The time is drawing near. The clock strikes 11.45. Hear those chimes. In a quarter hour, my life will have been spent. Look, Scrooge, man, look you here. Two gnarled baby dolls are taken from present skirts. Who are they? They are man's children, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. The boy is ignorance, the girl is want. Beware them both and all of their degree. But most of all, beware this boy, for I see that written on his brow which is doom, unless the writing be erased. He stretches out his arm, and his voice is now amplified, loudly and oddly. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Twelve chimes. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? A phantom hooded appears in dim light, downstage opposite. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Presence begins to deliquesce. Scrooge calls after him. Spirit, I'm frightened. Don't leave me. Spirit! Prisons, workhouses, prisons, workhouses. He is gone. Scrooge is alone now with the Phantom, who is, of course, the ghost of Christmas future. The Phantom is shrouded in black. Only its outstretched hand is visible from under his ghostly garment. Who are you, Phantom? Oh, yes, I... I think I know you. You are not, are, are you not, the spirit of Christmas yet to come? No reply. And you are about to show me the shadows of the things that have not yet happened, but will happen in time before us. Is that not so, spirit? The phantom allows Scrooge a look at his face. No other reply wanted here. A nervous giggle here. <laughs> oh, ghost of the future. I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know that your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company. Future does not reply, but for a stiff arm, hand, and finger set, pointing forward. Lead on, then. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me. Lead on, spirit. Future moves away from Scrooge in the same rhythm and motion employed at its arrival. Scrooge falls into the same pattern, a considerable space apart from the spirit. In the space between them, Marley appears. He looks to Future and then to Scrooge. He claps his hands, thunder and lightning. Three businessmen appear, spotlighted singularly. One is downstage left, one is downstage right, one is upstage center. Thus, six points of the stage should now be spotlighted, spotted in light. Marley will watch the scene from his position center, and Scrooge and Future are right and left of center. Did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? 
I thought he never died. Really? Oh, goodness knows, goodness knows. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard of you. Left it to his company, perhaps. Money to money, you know the expression. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> Nor to me, looks at second businessman. You then? You got his money? <laughs> me? Me? His money? No! They all laugh. It's likely to be a cheap funeral, for upon my life I don't know of a living soul who'd care to venture to, to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer? I don't mind going if lunch is provided, but I must be fed if I make one. Well, I'm the most disinterested among you, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. But I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Well then, bye-bye. 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 They glide off stage in three separate directions. Their lights follow them. Spirit, why did you show me this? Why do you show me businessmen from my streets as they take the deaths of Jacob Marley? That is a thing of past. You are future. Jacob Marley laughs a long, deep laugh. There's a thunderclap and lightning flash, and he is gone. Scrooge faces future, alone on stage now. Future wordlessly stretches out his arm, hand, and finger set, pointing into the distance, upstage. There above them, scoundrels fly by, half-dressed and slovenly. When this scene has passed, a woman enters the playing area. She is almost at once followed by a second woman, and then a man in faded black, and then suddenly an old man who smokes a pipe. The old man scares the other three. They laugh, anxious. Look here, old Joe. Here's a chance, if we haven't all three met here without meeting it. You couldn't have met in a better place. Come into the parlor. You were made free of it long ago, you know. And the other two ain't strangers. He stands and shuts the door, shrieking. We're all suitable to our calling. We're well matched. Come into the parlor. Come into the parlor. They follow him downstage. Scrooge and Future are now in their midst, watching silent. A truck comes in on which is set a small wall with fireplace and screen of rags, etc. All props for the scene. Let me just rake this fire over a bit. He does. He trims his lamp with the stem of his pipe. The first woman throws a large bundle on the floor. She sits beside it, cross-legged, defiantly. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Well, that's true indeed. No man more so. Why, then, don't stand staring as if you were afraid, woman? Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed. We should hope not. Very well, then. That's enough. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> no, indeed. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying, gasping out his last there, alone by himself. It's the truest word that was ever spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it were a heavier one. And it should have been. You may depend on it if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. We knew pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. No, no, my dear. I won't think of letting you being the first to show what you've earned, earned from this. I throw in mine. He takes a bundle from his shoulder and turns it upside down and empties its contents out on the floor. It's not very extensive, see? Uh, seals, a pencil case, sleeve buttons. Uh, nice sleeve buttons, though. Not bad, not bad. A brooch there. Not really valuable, I'm afraid. 
How much, old Joe? Old Joe writing on the wall with chalk. A pitiful lot, really. Ten and six, and not a sixpence more. You're not serious. That's your account, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Me! Mrs. Dilbert dumps out contents of her bundle. Sheets, towels, silver spoons, silver tongs, some boots. Old Joe writing on the wall. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. Here's your total coming up. Two pounds ten. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now do my bundle, Joe. Old Joe kneeling to open knots in her bundle. So many knots, madam. He drags out large curtains dark. What do you call this? Bed curtains? Ah, uh, yes, bed curtains. You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with him lying there? Yes, I did. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, and you'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching it out. For the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe, don't drop that lamp oil on those blankets now. His blankets? Whose else's do you think? He isn't likely to catch cold without him, I dare say. I hope that he didn't die of anything catching, eh? Don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I lord her about for him for such things if he did. Ah, uh, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you mean, they'd have wasted it? Putting on him to be buried in, to be sure. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. She laughs, as do they all, nervously. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't good enough then for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. Scrooge, in a low-pitched moan emits from his mouth, from the bones. Oh. One pound six for the lot. He produces a small flannel bag filled with money. He divvies it out, and he continues to pass around the money as he speaks. All are laughing. That's the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. Ha 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 He screams at them. Obscene demons! Why not market the corpse itself as selling its trimmings? Oh, spirit, I see it. I see it. This unhappy man, this stripped bare corpse, could very well be my own. My life holds parallel. My life ends that way now. Scrooge backs into something in the dark behind his spotlight. Scrooge looks at Future, who points to the corpse. Scrooge pulls back the blanket. The corpse is, of course, Scrooge, who screams. He falls aside the bed, weeping. Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. Future points to the corpse. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with the death. Where that dark chamber which we just left now, spirit, will be forever present to me. Future spreads his robes again, thunder and lightning, lights up upstage in the Cratchit home setting. Mrs. Cratchit and her daughter sewing. Tiny Tim's voice off stage. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Scrooge looking about the room to Future. Ha! Huh. Who spoke that? Who said that? Mrs. Cratchit puts down her sewing. The color hurts my eyes. She rubs her eyes. That's better. My eyes grow weak, sewing by candlelight. I shouldn't want to show your father weak eyes when he comes home. Not for the world. It must be near his time. Peter, in a corner reading, looks up from his book. Past it, rather, but I think he's been walking a bit slower than usual these last few evenings, Mother. I have known him walk with... 
to have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. And very fast indeed. So have I, mother. Often. So have I. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. Bob at the door. And there's your father at the door. Bob Cratchit enters. He wears a comforter. He is cold and forlorn. Father! H Hello, wife. Children. The daughter weeps and turns away from Cratchit. Children, how good to see you all. And you, wife. And look at this sewing. I've no doubt with all your industry we'll have a quilt to set down upon our knees in church on Sunday. You made the arrangements today then, Robert, for the service to be on Sunday? The funeral. Oh, well, yes. Yes, I did. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how great a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on Sunday after the service. My little, little child. My little child. Oh, Father, forgive me. I saw Mr. Scrooge's nephew, who you know I'd just met once before, and he was so wonderful to me, wife. He's the most pleasant-spoken gentleman I've ever met. He said, I am heartily sorry for it, and I'm heartily sorry for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, here's where I live. And he gave me this card. Let me see it. And he looked me straight in the eye, wife, and said meaningfully, I pray you'll come to me, Mr. Cratchit, if you need some help. I pray you do. Now, it wasn't for the sake of anything that he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way. It seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure that he's a good soul. You would be sure of it, my dear, if you saw and spoke to him. I shouldn't be at all surprised if he got Peter a situation. Only hear that, Peter? And then Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you. It's just as likely as not one of these days, though there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim, shall we? Or his first parting that was among us. Never, father, never. And when we recollect how patient and mild he was, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No, father, never. I am very happy. I am, I am, I am very happy. Bob kisses his little son, as does Mrs. Cratchit, as do the other children. The family is set now in one sculptural embrace. The lighting fades to a gentle pool of light tight on them. Spectre! Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how I know it. Future points to the other side of the stage. Lights out on Cratchits. Future moves slowing, gliding. Scrooge follows. Future points opposite. Future leads Scrooge to a wall and a tombstone. He points to the stone. Am I that man these ghoulish parasites so gloated over? Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or the shadows of things that may be only? Future points to the gravestone. Marley appears in light, well upstage. He points to grave as well. Gravestone turns front and grows to ten feet high. The words upon it, Ebenezer Scrooge. Much smoke billows now from the grave. Choral music here. Scrooge stands looking up at Gravestone. Future does not reply in mortal's words, but points once more to the gravestone. The stone undulates and glows. Music plays, beckoning Scrooge. Scrooge reeling in terror. Oh no, spirit! Oh no, no! Future's finger still pointing. Spirit, hear me! I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I would have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? 
Future considers Scrooge's logic. His hand wavers. Oh, good spirit, I see by your wavering hand that your good nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows that you have shown me by an altered life. Future's hand trembles. The pointing is stopped. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirit of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing that is upon this stone. Scrooge makes a desperate stab at grabbing Future's hand. He holds firm for a moment, but Future, stronger than Scrooge, pulls away. Scrooge is on his feet, praying. Spirit, dear spirit, I am praying before you. Give me a sign that all is possible. Give me a sign that all hope for me is not lost. Oh, spirit, kind spirit, I beseech thee, give me a sign. Future deliquesces slowly, gently. The phantom's hood and robe drop gracefully to the ground in a small heap. Music in. There's nothing in them. They're mortal cloth. The spirit is elsewhere. Scrooge has his sign. Scrooge is alone in a tableau. The light fades to black. Scene five. The end of it. Marley spotlighted opposite Scrooge in his bed. Spotlighted. Marley speaks to audience directly. Marley. He smiles at Scrooge. The firm of Scrooge and Marley is doubly blessed. Two misers turned. One, alas, in death. Too late. But the other miser turned in time's penultimate nick. Look you on my friend. Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge, scrambling out of bed, reeling delight. I will live in the past, in the present, and in the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Marley, he points and moves closer to Scrooge's bed. Yes, Ebenezer. The bedpost is your own. Believe it. Yes, Ebenezer. The room is your own. Believe it. Oh, Jacob Marley, wherever you are, Jacob, know ye that I praise you for this. I praise you and heaven and Christmas time. He kneels, facing away from Marley. I say it to you on my knees, oh, Jacob, on my knees. He touches his bed curtains. Not torn down. My bed curtains are not at all torn down. Rings and all, here they are. They're here. I am here. And the shadows of things that would have been may now be dispelled. They will be, Jacob. I know they will be. He chooses clothing for the day. He tries different pieces of clothing and settles perhaps on a dress suit, plus a cape of the bed clothing, something of color. I am light as a feather. I am happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. He yells out the window and then out to the audience. Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas to everybody. A happy new year to all the world. Hello there. Whoop, whoop. Hello, hello. I don't know what day of the month it is. I don't care. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. I don't care. I don't care a fig. I'd much rather be a baby than be an old wreck like me or Marley. Sorry, Jacob, wherever you be. Hello, hello there. Church bells chime in Christmas Day. A small boy named Adam is seen now downstage right as the light fades, upon, uh, fades up on him. Hey, you, boy! What's today? What day of the year is it? Today, sir? Why, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day, is it? Whoop! Well, I haven't missed it after all, have I? The spirits did all they did in one night. They can do anything they like, right? Of course they can. Of course they can. Excuse me, sir? Huh! Oh, yes, sir, of course. What's your name, lad? Scrooge and Adam will play their scene from their own spotlights. Adam, sir. Adam, what a fine, strong name. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I certainly should hope I know him, sir. A remarkable boy, an intelligent boy. Do you know where the poulterers have sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? I don't mean the little prize turkey, Adam. I mean the big one. What? Do you mean the one they've got as big as me? I mean the turkey the size of Adam. That's the bird. It's hanging there now, sir. It is? Go and buy it.
No, no, I'm absolutely in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here so that I may give them directions to where I want it delivered as a gift. Come back here with the man, Adam, and I'll give you a shilling. Come back here within, uh, with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. Oh, my, sir. Don't let my brother in on this. Adam runs off stage, and Marley smiles. An act of kindness is like the first green grape of summer. One leads to another and another. It would take a queer man indeed to not follow an act of kindness with an act of kindness. One simply wets the tongue for more. The taste of kindness is too, too sweet. Gifts, goods are lifeless. But the gift of goodness one feels in the giving is full of life. It is a wonder. He pauses and moves closer to Scrooge, who is totally occupied with his dressing and arranging of his room in his day. He is making lists, etc. Marley reaches out to Scrooge. Adam, calling off. I'm here! I'm here! Adam runs on with a man who carries an enormous turkey. Here I am, sir! Three minutes flat! A world record! I've got the poultry man, he's got the poultry! He pants, out of breath. I have earned my price, sir, if I live. He holds his heart, play-acting. Scrooge goes to him and embraces him. You are truly a champion, Adam. Here's the bird you ordered, sir. Oh, my, my. Look at the size of that turkey, will you? He never could have stood upon those legs, that bird. He would have snapped them in half in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. Why, you'll never be able to carry that bird to Camden Town. I'll give you money for a cab. Camden Town's where it's going, sir? Oh, I didn't tell you. Yes, I've written the precise address down just here on this. Hands paper to him. Bob Cratchit's house. Now he's not to know who sends him this. Do you understand me? Not a word. Handing out money and chuckling. I understand, sir. Not a word. Good there. There you go, then. This is for the turkey. He chuckles. And this is for the taxi. Chuckle. And this is for your world record run, Adam. But I don't have change for that, sir. Then keep it, my lad. It's Christmas. He kisses Scrooge's cheek quickly. Thank you, sir. Merry, Merry Christmas. He runs off. And you've given me a bit, uh, and you've given me a bit over much here too, sir. Of course I have, sir. It's Christmas. Oh, well, uh, thank you, sir. I'll have this bird to Mr. Cratch and his family in no time, sir. Don't you worry none about that. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, sir, and a very happy new year, too. And so, uh, pausing, if we look at who Scrooge was before, before he went to bed, he would never have given anyone extra money. He would never have given, like, a tip and, like, he, he's a, he was a miser. He kept his money, um, and he wouldn't spend it. And now he's generously giving people money left and right. Um, so we can see that the ghosts were effective, that there really was a turning point and that now his trajectory is much different. The man exits and Scrooge walks in a large circle about the stage, which, and remember, no one would have given him a kiss either. So like the fact that Adam gave him a kiss when no one would even like talk to him before shows like what a change uh, has happened. The man exits, Scrooge walks in a large circle about the stage, which is now gently lit. A chorus sings Christmas music far in the distance. Bells chime as well far in the distance. A gentlewoman enters and passes. Scrooge is on the streets now. Merry Christmas, madam. Merry Christmas, sir. The portly businessman from the first act enters. Merry Christmas, sir. Merry Christmas, sir. Oh, you. My dear sir, how, how do you do? I, I do hope that you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, Scrooge is my name, though I'm afraid you may not find it very pleasant. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to... He whispers into the man's ear. Lord bless me. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, and not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My dear sir, I don't know what to say to such munif... Scrooge, cutting him off. Don't say anything, please. Come and see me, will you? 
I will. I will. Oh, I will, Mr. Scrooge. It will be my pleasure. Thank you. I am much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. The portly man passes off stage, perhaps by moving backwards. Scrooge now comes to the room of his nephew and niece. He stops at the door, begins to knock on it, and he loses his courage, tries again, loses his courage again, tries again, fails again, and then backs off and runs at the door, causing a tremendous bump against it. The nephew and niece are startled. Scrooge, poking head into room. Fred! Why, bless my soul, who's that? How now? Who goes? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. Dear heart alive. I have come to dinner. May I come in, Fred? May you come in? With such pleasure for me, you may, Uncle. What a treat. What a treat, Uncle Scrooge. Come in, come in. They embrace a shocked and delighted Scrooge. Fred calls the others into the room. Come in here, everybody, and meet my Uncle Scrooge. He's come to our Christmas party. Music in. Light, lighting here indicates that, the, that day has gone to night and gone to day again. It is early, early morning. Scrooge walks alone from the party, exhausted, to his offices, opposite side of the stage. He opens his offices. The offices are as they were at the start of the play. Scrooge seats himself with his door wide open so he can see into the tank as he awaits Cratchit, who enters, head down, full of guilt. Cratchit starts writing almost before he sits. What do you mean by coming in here at this time of day? A full 18 minutes late, Mr. Cratchit. Hello, sir. Do you hear me? I'm very sorry, sir. I, I am behind my time. You are. Yes, I certainly think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only but once a year, sir. It, it shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday and into the night. Now I'll tell you what, Cratchit. I'm not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... He stands and pokes his finger into Bob's chest. I am about to raise your salary. Oh, no, sir, I... What, what did you say, sir? A Merry Christmas, Bob. He claps Bob's back. A Merry Christmas, Bob, my good fellow. Then I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. And we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a bowl of smoking bishop. Bob, make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob. It's too cold in this place. We need warmth and cheer, Bob Cratchit. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Bob Cratchit stands. He smiles at Scrooge. Bob Cratchit faints. Blackout. As the main lights black out, a spotlight appears on Scrooge, center stage. Another on Marley. He talks directly to the audience. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as the old city knew. Or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of any of us, in all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, Tiny Tim atop Scrooge's shoulder, God bless us, everyone. Lights up on chorus, singing final Christmas song. Scrooge and Marley and all spirits and other characters of play join in. When the song is over, the lights fade to black.